I want to talk this evening, before I get any further into that, which I will a bit more later, about changing patterns of religious affiliation and spirituality in Canada. One of the reasons I want to do that is because it leads into a discussion about spiritual and religious care. That's a really important uh, conceptual world to move into for us in hospice palliative care. There is a vast literature out there uh, about the impact of spirituality and religious participation uh, on health. When I was, pub uh, when I was ordained 20 five years ago this past May, I was aware of two published articles on that subject. There are now well over 1,200 in the literature. And they come from doctors, from nurses, psychologists, chaplains, and a range of others who are talking about the impact of spirituality and religious participation on health. But in order to really grasp how that relates to hospice palliative care, you've got to really understand the difference between spirituality and religion. And as I went around the room a little bit <clears throat> today and meeting a number of people, I hear many different patterns of the provision of what broadly is called spiritual care throughout your different hospice programs. And I know from experience that there is a great diversity of practice in this country and a lot of inequity in terms of uh, the services that are available in some places and not in others. But one of the big issues is, first of all, what service is it you want to provide? So we'll get to that. We'll talk a little bit then about how these contribute to the healing that we are hoping our patients will have and their families will have in hospice palliative care. The understanding, first of all, of the differences between spiritual and religious care and the importance of the healing of the human being that this understanding can, can bring. Lastly, some opportunities and challenges. Now, there has been quite a study over the years on uh, patterns of religious observance in Canada. Right not too far from here is a, a well-known uh, Canadian scholar, um, Reginald Bibby, uh, from the Lethbridge area, uh, who every year since, every five years since 1975, has published the findings of a very long-term ongoing study, which wraps up next year, um, called the Project Canada Research Program. And spinning out of that study, he's done uh, some, some major publishing, uh, very uh, significant books on the subject of the changing patterns of religious observance and spirituality in Canada. Now, he notices that until the 1960s or 70s, there was a pretty steady decline in religious participation in the Canadian mainline churches. That uh, decline, he feels now, has stabilized. And there are some indications of growth. So before we count religion down and out, keep in mind that it still remains important for a great many Canadians. A majority of Canadians, 76%, um, according to Statistics Canada 19, um, 2001 survey, 76% of Canadians describe themselves as connected to the Christian faith in some way, shape, form, or the other. That, by the way, is down from 83% 10 years before. The second largest group, interestingly enough, is the non-religious. 16% up from 13%. Now, that's an interesting number, isn't it? And I find that in my clinical practice. More people are describing themselves as non-religious or not very religious and only 8% some other religion. So what that says is that there are still roughly 84% of Canadians who describe themselves as religious, <clears throat> Christian or non-Christian, but religious. A significant and growing number describe themselves as non-religious. Now on the surface of things, you say, what a religious country. But in clinical practice, I find only about half the people who describe themselves as religious have any viable connection to a religious organization in the community. In other words, they used to be something. <laughs> so, used to be Catholic, used to be Anglican, used to be Baptist, used to be something. And so what we want to recognize is that those people are out of touch often with the, the, the very thing that they identify themselves as part of. 
and they start looking often at the end of life for some more religious connection but don't know how to acquire it. It's just too long a distance, too far a distance from the time when they were actively connected to where they are today. So they need some religious facilitation. Now, that part of it we understand very well. That's part of religious care. That's providing care for people that facilitates their perceived religious needs. Talk more about that by way of a definition just a little later. You'll get these notes tomorrow, by the way, so you'll have these definitions and, and concepts for you, for, for you. And interestingly enough, not only the 16% who are non-religious, but many of the people who are religious say, yeah, I still want to see Father so-and-so for sacrament of the sick, but I want to talk to you about life. Or there's something I want to talk to you about that I'm not going to tell my parish priest. Absolutely no way. <laughs> That kind of thing often fits into the category of spiritual care, which again I'll define a little bit more. Bigger issues about life, the meaning of life, matters which don't seem to be appropriate for the religious care provider, but which are still profoundly significant to the client. Now interestingly, Bibby and others studying Canadian religious practice note this. Religious observance has declined dramatically since the 50s, stabilized in the last decade, but the nature of religious interest and participation has changed considerably. Now, you might get this really quickly. I think likely you will. More and more Canadians are consuming religion a la carte. Much like the buffet tonight, there's a table of 100 items. I don't know about you, but I can really only manage about six or seven of them and maybe try to get a tiny piece of two or three more, but there's no way I can have even something of everything that's on the table. But it's all there for my choice. And that is very much the way Canadian religious practice is going these days. People are picking what they want from the table of alternatives. So the fact that I'm an Anglican doesn't mean a darn thing. You have to know what kind of Anglican I am. And not only what kind that might be like some other group of Anglicans, but what about me as a person? What do you really know about the kind of Anglican I am? Now, if I were to go around this room, probably 40% of you would be Roman Catholics. I can guarantee you that that 40% would be full of different Roman Catholics. I've often heard it said, if you have 10 religious people in any room, you'll have 12 opinions. <laughs> <clears throat> so keep that in mind clinically. You know what? We whitewash everybody with the same brush. Oh, you're this, so you need that. That's just not true in clinical practice. Just not true. You have to do an individual assessment of where a person is coming from, what their resources are, and what they need. And friends, we're not doing that in hospice palliative care a whole bunch today. We're not providing skilled assessment of where a person is coming from, who they are, what their resources are, what their needs are, and how they wish to be cared for in the terms of spirituality and religion. So we need to be thinking a lot about that. There's the first part of the challenge I'll give you tonight. So we're smorgasbord religious people these days. Writer Kevin, uh, Ward in a, a two, Kevin Ward in a 2004 web published article entitled Religion in a Post-Aquarian Age, um, and he does a very interesting international analysis, says that there is a clear move from public to private religious activity. So the fact that I'm an Anglican doesn't mean I go to church. You'd have to ask me about that. And how often do I go and where? And what do I get out of it anyway? What good is it to me? We, not, we, should, we ought not to assume that because someone participates in something, it means a whole bunch to them. It's really important to ask, what's important to you? So we're becoming more and more fragmented in our religious participation, and that presents challenges to the provision of spiritual and religious care in hospice palliative care. More voluntaristic, in Ward's words, 
more consumer-oriented, more captive to the subjective, expressive dimensions of cultural individualism. So in this increasingly consumer-oriented, individualistic culture, more and more we need to provide individual assessment and care, individualized assessment and care. But Bidby says, even though religious participation and, 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 and observance are changing, there appears to be a considerable market for the very things that religion historically has been about. In other words, people are still asking the same questions of meaning and belief they always did. They're just asking different people about them. And they're coming up with different kinds of answers than they customarily did. And so we need to be alert to the different ways that people are making meaning and discovering things like hope and faith and belief today. It's not the same as it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. And the ways we used to practice spiritual and religious care and train people to provide that care just won't work today, or not nearly as well as they used to. So here's some implications for hospice palliative care. Religious affiliation and observance continues to be important. Cannot be assumed, it cannot be assumed that healthcare providers um, can just ignore the religious needs of people because somehow we're less religious. It's not that we're less religious, it's that we're religious in different ways. Religious practice is less conformist than ever, a fact that health providers and institutions need to realize in the design of programs to meet people's needs. Just think about it this way, different strokes for different folks, and consequently, different models of care than we have had in the past. More people are defining themselves, certainly in my clinical practice every day, as more spiritual than religious. How many of you have heard that expression? Yeah, it's common. It's common. I don't know that there's been quite enough study about the number of people that would use that expression, but I can tell you it happens every day in my clinical practice. And that has huge implications for the kind of care we provide people. So spiritual care has an even bigger meaning than it used to. More people are saying, yeah, I want spiritual, not religious care. There are still lots wanting religious care, but more people are starting to use the language of spirituality than, relig uh, than religion than ever before. This involves diverse and evolving knowledge sets. People being trained for this kind of ministry and doing it need to be able to do it with diversity, understand cultural diversity, understand the different religions and philosophies of the world and be able to move comfortably in some of that conversation. It requires innovative and advanced intervention skills, more inclusive and flexible personal and professional attributes than are sometimes found in traditional models of religious care. So we need to find the right kind of people to do this work and provide them with the right kind of care. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a very quick definition about spirituality and religion. <clears throat> you can take this home and think on it. I believe it is well supported in the current palliative care literature. Spirituality is about individual beliefs, values, and relationships around which we organize our personal system of meaning and our sense of who we are in the universe. Now that might sound pretty loosey-goosey to you, but it really works in clinical practice. Spirituality is about what matters most to you. It may have little or nothing at all to do with religion or traditional religious language. Even an atheist or an agnostic has a spirituality by this definition, but I wouldn't insult such a person by using that term. I would say, what's your philosophy of life? It comes to the same thing. And if we don't address a person's spirituality or philosophy of life, we're going to find a phenomenon occurring that is documented quite well in the literature today, and that is spiritual and existential distress. People are going to experience what is sometimes called spiritual pain, and we're not going to meet those needs if we don't properly assess uh, their spiritual uh, resources and needs, and if we don't make those distinctions between spirituality and, uh, and religion and spiritual care and religious care. You might be interested to know that the research clearly supports that unassessed, untreated spiritual existential pain 
lowers a client's spiritual well-being. And this complicates medical treatment and is potentially an underlying cause of intractable symptoms. I can give you case after case that demonstrate that. Increases anxiety and requests for health system support. They want more care because their needs aren't being met. Negatively affects length of stay. And any health care uh, managers and administrators here know right away that that means the bottom line. It reduces client quality of life and results in a less peaceful death. And if that isn't the goal of palliative care, to bring about an improved quality of life and more peaceful death, I don't know why we're here. People's spiritual and philosophical needs are central to their perception that they can die a good death and have lived a meaningful life. And lastly, but by no means the least significant, it results in a more complicated pattern of bereavement for survivors. Bereavement is perhaps the greatest untreated, uh, treatable health condition in our society. And very often, a lot of it has to do with issues of meaning and meaning reconstruction and reframing and basically spiritual and philosophical matters. I'm going to move very quickly. There's more stuff there in the notes later about spiritual care and religious care for you, but I won't go on to them. Over the last six weeks, I've spoken with several groups in southern Saskatchewan uh, and people from other places in Saskatchewan about what the needs are for this kind of thing in their community. Um, I spoke in <clears throat> Lumsden, Saskatchewan a couple of weeks ago uh, to 20 palliative care service coordinators and program directors from across Saskatchewan. I spoke in Estevan, Saskatchewan a week ago with uh, 32 persons, mostly volunteers, but a few clergy and, and medical people. About 20 persons in uh, Weyburn, Saskatchewan, <clears throat> 24 I think it was, who were mostly nurses. There was one pastor and one very good man who said, I came because my wife told me I had to. <laughs> and he sat and listened to the whole thing. And I asked them some questions at the end of my presentation on spiritual and religious care. And one of the things I said to them uh, was, so who provides this care in your communities? Can you identify the person? In most cases, there was no one that they could identify. There either wasn't such a person or they weren't sure who it was. In most cases, there simply wasn't a person designated to provide this care. They mostly depended upon referrals to local clergy. And such caregivers, the local clergy and, and religious leadership, were not part of the health care team. They were outside the loop of medical information. And all of us know that team-based care makes a difference in palliative care. If you're not on the team, you have less to contribute to the client's well-being. In many cases, it was the nurse or the care coordinator who provided the spiritual care. And a study of the nursing literature will show very readily that most nurses do not feel adequate to provide spiritual care because they either don't understand it terribly well, don't feel well enough trained to offer it, or feel that it's just not their job. I happen to be involved in, in training nurses for spiritual care, and I believe in it. But most nurses don't feel up to that. And yet they are often asked to bear a great part of that burden in healthcare. And lastly, I ask, so how do you want to be helped? <clears throat> what kind of system development or educational support would enhance uh, your circumstances where you are? And here are a, qu a few quick figures. 71% of the care coordinators felt that specialized for credit training programs, such as clinical pastoral education, which I've mentioned a bit earlier, but not really described in any depth, um, was the kind of program that would be appropriate for the training of designated chaplains. So in other words, if they were going to have a chaplain in their program, they'd want that person to have CPE, clinical pastoral education, a nationally certified training program in hospice palliative care. 78% of the nurses felt that one or two day modular live instructed courses or courselets offered locally or regionally would help them best to offer spiritual care as nurses. And 55 to 56% of nurses and volunteers felt that live instructed, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> felt that either live instructed modular courses or web-based resources would best enable them to provide spiritual care 
as nurses or volunteers. So my sense is that <clears throat> you and me, those of us out there in the business of hospice palliative care, know that we need support. Know that we need some kind of equipping to do our part of the spiritual care work. But we also know that we need trained, competent people to provide formal chaplaincy. Excuse me. <clears throat> now these challenges for you tonight. Does your hospice palliative care program, it always comes back to that, doesn't it? It comes back to roost. Does your hospice palliative care program pr provide a place in the CHPCA defined square of care and square of organization for spiritual care? If not, why not? Why isn't it being funded when it's clearly in the national and international standards for the practice of hospice palliative care? If it isn't being provided in your home health region, do you think that this needs to change? Because if you don't think it needs to change, it probably won't. I think that's what we've heard today. Change comes from me. Sorry, but I got to do it. And so do you. So if you capture some sense that that's important, take it home and ask those questions of your teams. If in fact there is somebody doing it, whether it's community clergy, whether it's a chaplain. So who is that person? Do you know? Is that person well known to your team? Do they know how to access that person? What are the qualifications of that person in chaplaincy, any kind of formal chaplaincy training? And have they had any training specific to hospice palliative care? If not, what are their training needs? What kind of training do you think they need? I've given you some answers already. Uh, from some of the Saskatchewan groups to that question tonight, but you'll have your own. What resources exist to support their continuing professional development as hospice palliative care or spiritual care practitioners? I remember <clears throat> just in this past couple of weeks reading an article that uh, Michael had passed on to me about the uh, level of funding in a number of, uh, of areas of practice and business uh, for continuing professional development and health care scored really low. And I know what the numbers are in my health region, and they're really low. <laughs> and if it weren't for a particularly visionary program of community cooperation to make our education program the dynamic success it was, we wouldn't have one. That's Wednesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to think about. So how are you going to train these people to do that job? Is spiritual care in your hospice palliative care program offered as an integral part of the care team or as an external add-on? If it's an external add-on, it will be less value added to your program. If you want to add value to your spiritual care program, make that person or persons a member of your team on the inside of the health care loop. Make them sign the oath of confidentiality. Let them see the chart. Let them go to rounds. Let them know what's going on so they can really deal with the life and death issues our patients deal with every day. Is your health team aware of the growing evidence that spirituality and religious activity can positively affect health outcomes, including the end of life journey around things like quality of life? If not, then we'll be providing some research for you through the Pallium Project on its uh, Palliative Learning Commons website at some point in the not very distant future so that you'll be able to access current state-of-the-art information about that kind of thing. <clears throat> now, do your jurisdiction's healthcare makers, healthcare policy makers, regional health authorities, and local programs recognize that access to quality care for hospice palliative care clients will remain elusive until a provision has been made for skilled spiritual care providers to join the team? If we want to have quality, spiritual care needs to be at the table. So my final word of challenge to, to you and myself this evening is, will you go back to your home community and jurisdiction and call for and work towards the development and support of such a service? If you say yes to that, your clients will thank you. Thanks.
Well, system change is a part of all that, but it starts with vision. I, I know my own circumstances best. I, I know quite a number of chaplains around the country and, and how they're working. There are very few fortunate enough to be in my position, just maybe a few of us, full-time palliative care chaplains. There are not many. One of the ways I got to be that way is there was some very creative thinking about budgets and how to transfer funds from one place to the other. And there was also a job description which said, you don't just look after our tertiary palliative care unit, but you look after our long-term care palliative care patients and you look after our home care patients. So you follow our patients in every location of care. And you know what? Last year, uh, I and my students saw 380 patients. And that's not including their families, but I just mean patients and then all the needs that grow out of that. So that's a large caseload, in my opinion. That's about half of our program. And what it says to me is there's probably another half that didn't get to see us. We need to grow. There's still, still room to grow. But it also says to me that multi-site model works. Think about that when you're designing the program. Find a way. As far as identifying the capable people, part of it is we hope to spin off to you within the next year, I would say, a good competency tool that you'll be able to access off the Pallium website that will allow you to look at what the sort of skills and uh, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of a good hospice palliative care chaplain should be. And from that, that'll shorten your list pretty quickly. Then at that point, you start saying, okay, so we've got a reasonable group of people. If we're going to hire locally, who are the ones with most of that quality? Are they interested? Would they be interested? Have we got some kind of a deal to offer them to get them to come on board? And how can we train them further? All of us are in continuing professional development in, in healthcare, or you're dead in the water in a very short while. So you need to keep up at it all the time. So it is possible to take reasonably capable people and sharpen them up really well.